There was always something special about her. Young Mary Baker of Bow, New Hampshire, born July 16, 1821, baby of the six Baker children. Growing up on the Baker farm, thoughtful, caring, serious, when she wasn't joking and laughing with her sisters. Often nursing little farm animals back to health. Often needing nursing herself. Through childhood and teenage years, her health so fragile her family and friends feared she might not live to adulthood. Frequently too ill to attend the schoolhouse. Studious in spite of that. Often with pen in hand writing her thoughts, thoughts sometimes at odds with the hard theology of her father and the clergy. Often with her nose in a book. Often the book was her Bible. In the years ahead, the Bible would be her companion, her teacher, her lamp in the dark. In 1836, the Bakers moved from the hills of Bow to a farm on the outskirts of Sanborton Bridge, with Mary blossoming into the young Belle, attractive, witty, fun, bubbling with parties, excursions, fashions, and bows coming round. Presently, Mr. George Washington Glover came round, courting. Glover, a Yankee who'd left New England to seek his fortune in the Deep South, returning north for a visit and smitten with the youngest Baker girl, proposed marriage. December 1843, Mary, at 22, became Mrs. George Washington Glover in a wedding at the Baker home. Mother and father Baker, fearing to have the frail daughter they loved go so far from home. On Christmas Day, Mr. and Mrs. Glover set sail for Charleston and a new life in the Carolinas. Six months later, catastrophe. George, dead of yellow fever, laid to rest in this Wilmington churchyard. His young widow, returning home to New Hampshire, alone, destitute, and expecting a child. With the birth of Georgie, Mary Baker Glover found herself a 23-year-old single mother, reduced to living in the Baker home, wholly dependent on her father's generosities and judgments. Her health, always fragile, now strained by a difficult delivery, broke, leaving her a semi-invalid, unable much of the time to care for her child. The boy grew more rambunctious as the years passed. The family decided for her to send Georgie off to be cared for by a farm family in North Groton, a logging and mining town 40 miles to the north. In time, the widow Glover, suffering much of the time, but still young, bright, attractive, was courted by Daniel Patterson, a dentist, handsome, charming, smartly turned out, making a great show of devotion, warm letters passing between them. In 1853, she became Mrs. Patterson, upon a promise from her husband that he would be the father to her growing boy, that promise to be broken, the first of many during the years that followed. The couple moved to North Groton to be near her son, but in the end, the Cheney family relocated to the Midwestern frontier, taking the now 11-year-old Georgie with them without her knowledge, but with mutual agreement between her family and her husband. It would be years before mother and son would see each other again, and by then, their lives had taken very separate paths. With borrowed money, Patterson put himself into a sawmill business near their house. His wife's daily life reverberated with the grinding noise less than a hundred feet from her door. Her boy now pulled from her. She, chronically ill and bedridden, tied to her husband's failing fortunes, his sawmill business and their home eventually foreclosed. The world was dark for Mary Baker Patterson. 
Her life was further shadowed by the disappointments of her marriage with Patterson. The couple moved frequently, were frequently parted. He drawn away to various ventures, some of them involving other women. An engaging but improvident and faithless man, as it was turning out. She was drawn by whatever promised healing, trying the many novel therapies of the day, homeopathy, hydropathy, the water cure, Graham's dietary system. As she tried one cure after another, she did not find health for herself, but she did find hints that illness was neither physical law nor divine will, but human error. One such hint caught her eye in 1862 in an advertising circular, a reputed magnetic healer, Phineas P. Quimby of Portland, Maine, claimed to cure illness by treating the patient's thoughts. Quimby's claims in his practice would prove to be a far cry from Mary Patterson's deeply Christian convictions. But at the Vale Hydropathy Sanitarium, as she took the water cure, growing weaker by the day, often barely able to sit up, Quimby's claims inspired hope she wrote for an appointment with a magnetic healer. Her now well-to-do sister, Abby, most likely provided travel funds. Her brother and sister-in-law escorted her on the packet ship to Portland. In Portland, she had to be carried up the stairs to her hotel room. For all that, her expectations were high. Phineas Quimby, the former exhibition hall hypnotist, small, gray-haired, with a kindly face and piercing dark eyes, exuded a commanding confidence that he would heal any ailment. He claimed to be treating hundreds of patients a year. They would send for me and the undertaker, and the one who got there first would get the case. Phineas P. Quimby. His method was much the same for each of them. Put everyone else out of the room, demand the patient think of nothing but him, plunge his own hands into a basin of water to increase the presumed magnetic flow from his body and manipulate the patient's head, stomach, back. But most important, he would talk, talk with utter conviction, talk of the certainty of his cure. His new patient, this Mrs. Patterson, responded wonderfully. By her own account, in less than one week from that time, I ascended by a stairway of 182 steps to the dome of the city hall. Her bodily suffering appeared to have been alleviated by these treatments through Quimby's thought and the magnetism of his touch. It seemed nearly miraculous. Could this be like the healing touch of the Christ? Quimby himself saw little, if any, connection between his theory and religious Christianity. As for his patient, away from the healer's magnetic presence, Mary Patterson found her old ills returned. She wrote Quimby for help and revisited him for treatment again and again. All the while her Bible, her lamp in the dark, told her, I am the Lord that healeth thee. These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. In Phineas Quimby's practice, she found a hint of that promise, but only a hint. She found another hint in March 1864 in Warren, Maine, where she stayed two months as a guest of Miss Mary Ann Jarvis. Miss Jarvis suffered terribly from consumptive coughs and labored breathing, especially she was convinced when the wind was from the east. Gasping for breath one day, the woman begged her guest for aid. Sitting silently beside her, Mrs. Patterson complied. As she later described her mental treatment, in a few moments her breath came gently, the inspirations becoming deep and natural. We then requested her to look at the weather vane. She saw it was due east. The wind had not changed, but her difficult breathing had gone. Therefore, it was not the wind that produced it. And our explanations broke this mental hallucination. So striking was that experience to Mary Patterson, she would later write of it as her first discovery that science mentally applied would heal the sick. It was all part of a great stir in her thought. One friend remembers hearing her say, if all diseases are unreal and not good, God, who is good and real, should be our only healer. 
and I believe that if we only knew how to ask him, we should need no other. These were times when, in her words, God had been graciously preparing me during many years for the reception of this final revelation of the absolute divine principle of scientific mental healing. By the end of 1864, the Pattersons were in the great shoe manufacturing city of Lynn, Massachusetts. He, looking to find a new field for his dental practice, she, still looking to find the way to health. The next year, 1865, in the fall, the couple rented a second floor apartment on Paradise Road in Swampscott, bordering Lynn. Here, the many years of preparation were gathering to a head. In Swampscott, as winter came on, Mary Patterson attended a church wrote poems for the local newspapers, an added source of income, shared temperance society meetings when she was well enough, sometimes assisted in her husband's dental office. The evening of Thursday, February 1st, 1866, on an icy street corner in Lynn, Mary Patterson took a bad fall. Unconscious, she was carried to a home across the street. A physician diagnosed serious internal injuries, noting sharp pain in the head and neck. The next day, she was brought home in a sleigh and carried upstairs to her apartment, where she was placed on a cot in the kitchen, near the heat of the stove. The doctor said he could do nothing more for her. Worried friends stayed around the clock, fearing the worst. Her husband, away on one of his travels, was telegraphed to come home quickly. Friday and Saturday, she lay in critical condition. Every time she moved, there was severe pain. Sunday afternoon, she sought hope in the pages of her Bible. On this day, something in its familiar words spoke to her afresh. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, and he arose. In a moment of profound spiritual insight, she announced she would get to her feet and walk. She immediately pushed herself, unaided, to the side of the bed, placed her feet on the floor, and walked to the side of the room and sat in a chair. Then she says, This is all through prayer, George Newhall. Those who saw it were astonished. She herself could not explain it. How had this happened? Was this how Jesus and his disciples healed? The sudden recovery marked a turning point in her thought, but it was only a beginning. What she needed now was peace and quiet to ponder what her healing might mean. But a few weeks later, the house on Paradise Road was put up for sale. The Pattersons moved on to a series of temporary quarters. At one of them, her husband of 13 years deserted her. The break would be final. Several years later, she would legally end the union with Patterson, citing his desertion and adultery. Left on her own with almost no funds, she moved from place to place in and around Lynn. Resuming the name of her deceased first husband, she was once again known as Mary B. Glover. Through all this, she sought to relate her healing to spiritual laws of God, which were demonstrated to her through a string of healings. People suffering with consumption, pneumonia, diphtheria, cancer, bone disease, and others, all healed. There was James Wheeler, whose seriously infected finger was scheduled to be amputated. Wheeler had no use for Mrs. Glover's ideas about spiritual healing, but his wife had begged her to come and help him. Mrs. Glover encountered Wheeler on his way out the door for his appointment with a surgeon. She asked him, Will you allow me to stand here a few minutes before you go and think about your finger? He said he would, but he had no time to waste. She stood thoughtfully five minutes or so. At some point, Wheeler examined his hand in disbelief. Shortly, he rubbed his finger, said it didn't hurt anymore, 
went outside to his waiting carriage, and went about his business. On a beach near Lynn, seven-year-old George Norton, his feet deformed since birth, lay on pillows where his mother had placed him while she hitched the horse and went for water. Young George had never walked on those club feet, but when his mother returned, he was not on the pillows. Down by the water's edge, Mrs. Norton saw her boy walking haltingly, hand in hand, with a woman she had never seen before. It was Mrs. Glover. From that moment, the boy's feet straightened and gained strength rapidly. He grew up leading a normal life, going on to become an engineer. In New Hampshire, Mrs. Glover's niece, Ellen Pillsbury, had suffered typhoid fever, only to be diagnosed with severe enteritis. For two weeks, the girl's stomach was so sore, people tiptoed around her bed because their every footstep caused her pain. Falling into a delirium, Ellen didn't even know those around her. The doctor's prognosis was terminal. When we found Ellen did not have a chance to live, we wrote Mary about it, and she came to us at once. We went to Ellen's room, and Mary sat beside her bed. In a short time, she looked up and said, I'm glad to see you, Auntie. Mary soon told her to rise and walk. Well, we were horrified at this. She rose, however, and walked across the room. Martha Rand Baker. She told her to stamp her foot strongly upon the floor, and she did so without suffering from it. The next day, she was dressed and went down to the table, and the fourth day went a journey of about a hundred miles in the cars. Elizabeth Baker. Afterward, Ellen herself and most of the Baker and Pillsbury families disavowed her healing, but many others who were cured by Mrs. Glover never forgot her. How was all this happening? She knew that cures were produced in primitive Christianity by holy, uplifting faith. But I must know the science of this healing. To comprehend that science, she searched the scriptures. In her words, the Bible was my only textbook. She would say later, In the latter part of 1866, I gained the scientific certainty that all causation was mind, God and every effect a mental phenomenon. On one occasion, she went to the aid of a Mrs. Gale. She was told the woman was dying of pneumonia. She found her helpless and propped up on pillows, attended by a physician. Seeing the patient's thought needed to be aroused, she pulled the pillows away and told her that she could get up, that she would help her dress. Mrs. Gale was healed on the spot. The amazed physician asked Mrs. Glover to tell him how she did it. She said she couldn't tell him, that it was God. The physician urged that she make her healing method known. Why don't you write it in a book, publish it, and give it to the world? That was the rugged path she would take. But first, she would search for followers who could be taught to demonstrate the science of Christian healing as she did. <laughs> 